Earlier in this chapter, we learned that the HTTP protocol is stateless. We also learned how cookies can be used to track and to remember user interactions from one visit of that user to a given website to the next. That is, as a computer scientist would say, cookies can help us remember state about a user. Cookies can be used to enhance the user experience. For example, you go to a website, you log in, you give your password, you specify that you want to see a website in English. The next time you come back to that website, the fact that you've authenticated yourself, the fact that you prefer English can be remembered by cookies. So cookies are really valuable in that sense and in easing your interactions with one given website. But cookies can also be used for other purposes, such as to track your behavior across multiple websites, not just one, but multiple websites. And in some cases, without you even knowing that that's happening. Wow. Well, let's take a look at that and let's start by remembering how a web page is actually put together before it's displayed by a browser. Well, let's start with a simple example of, say, displaying the sports page from the New York Times. I type in www.newyorktimes.com slash sports into my web browser, and what do I see? Something like this. Now let's take a closer look at that displayed web page. And we can see in this example that there are two parts. Remember that I typed in newyorktimes.com to my web browser, so the first part of the displayed page is the content retrieved from the New York Times, shown in green here. The displayed web page also contains an advertisement, in this example from Purdue Global. That advertisement is not served from the New York Times web server that I contacted, but rather by some other server. Let's take a closer look now at how this happens. Here are the steps that are taken by my web browser. First, my browser contacts newyorktimes.com to get the base HTML file. My browser then parses that base HTML file and finds a reference to the URL of a web server, say adx.com, shown in purple here. My browser then contacts adx.com to get the ad. The ad's returned. My browser assembles the page to be displayed from these two parts, the content from the New York Times and the ad, and then displays the page. Let's next take a look at the exchange of HTTP messages here. So here's the setting. We've got my browser, we've got the newyorktimes.com web server, and we've got the adx.com web server. In step one, my browser uses the HTTP get message to request the base page from the newyorktimes.com web server. The Times web server then responds with the HTTP reply message containing the base HTML file. In step three, my browser then parses the HTML file, finds the reference to adx.com. In steps four and five, HTTP get and HTTP reply messages are used to request and then receive the ad content from adx.com. In this case, an ad for purdueglobal.com. In step six, the page is assembled by my browser and in step seven, it's displayed. Well, we've just seen an example of how multiple websites are contacted by your browser, even when your browser wants to just display a single page. And let's see how cookies might be used here. And we're going to start with this example. I've shown cookie jars. Each of the cookie jars are initially empty in your browser and in the website that you're going to visit. Let's now take a look at the previous example, but let's see how cookies are used. Step one is just like before. Cookies aren't involved yet since my browser's cookie jar is empty. When this first HTTP request is received at the New York Times web server, the server first creates a cookie with a value of 1634 and stores that cookie value, 1634, in its database, in its cookie jar, and stores information along with that cookie value, say maybe that a sports page was requested on 215.22. Now let's take a close look at the HTTP reply message. When the New York Times server replies, it returns the requested content, but it also has a set cookie field in the HTTP reply header with a value of 1634. My browser receives the HTTP reply message, sees the cookie value of 1634, stores that value in its cookie jar, and records that this cookie value is associated with the newyorktimes.com. This kind of cookie is sometimes called a first party cookie since it comes from a site that I explicitly asked my browser to visit.
And so far, this is just like we studied in section 2.2 of the book. And here's where things get interesting. Remember that the New York Times base HTML file had a reference to adx.com. So, and when it makes that HTTP GET request to adx.com, it will also include a new type of header field, the referrer field, indicating that the browser making the HTTP request was referred to adx.com by a New York Times sports page. Well, when adx gets this HTTP request message, what does it do? Well, of course, it creates a cookie with a value of 7493 in this case, and it remembers that cookie value 7493 is associated with a browser that has just viewed the New York Times sports page. The edX server responds with an HTTP reply message containing the requested content and also a set cookie header field with a value of 7493. My browser receives the HTTP reply message, sees the cookie value of 7493, stores that value in its cookie jar, and records that this cookie value is associated with adx.com. So let's pause here and think about that cookie value of 7493 associated with adx.com. Hey, all I wanted to do was go to newyorktimes.com. I got a New York Times cookie, okay, but I also got a cookie from adx now in my cookie jar, and I never explicitly asked my browser to visit adx. This cookie from adx is sometimes called a third-party cookie, since it comes from a site that I never explicitly asked my browser to visit. The third-party cookie was placed in my cookie jar even though I never explicitly asked my browser to visit adx.com. Well, so far we've seen that my browser's managed to get an unwanted cookie in its cookie jar, but that's no big deal in terms of resources. A cookie's less than 4K bytes. So what's the problem here? Well, if adx has ads on lots of web pages, as we'll see, adx is going to be able to get a lot of data about my browsing behavior, about the many websites I've visited. And you know the saying, that is the currency of the 21st century. So let's see what can happen. Suppose I next want to buy a pair of socks. And when I go to socks.com, there's an ad on that site placed by adx.com. Well, my browser retrieves the socks.com webpage, sees the embedded URL for adx.com, and so makes an HTTP request to adx.com to get this ad. But, and this is important, because my browser already has an adx.com cookie, my HTTP request to adx.com not only contains the referrer header field of socks.com, also includes the adx cookie value of 7493. Hmm, it's starting to look a little suspicious. Now what happens when adx gets this request? It sees the cookie value of 7493 and says, hey, I've seen this browser before. Last time this browser visited the New York Times, this time it visited socks.com. And adx dutifully records this new fact in its cookie jar. Now, now, as you can see, adx is starting to learn more about me than just my one-off request to read the New York Times. In particular, it knows that I, or actually my browser, reads the New York Times and is looking at socks. Now, because adx is tracking my web browsing behavior over multiple sites with adx ads, it's going to be able to return targeted ads to me based on my browsing history. Let's see how that's done. Now let's suppose a day later, I use my browser to read the New York Times again, say the art section this time. And of course, adx.com has its ad URL embedded in that New York Times webpage. So my browser does an HTTP GET to the New York Times page, sees the adx embedded reference, and sends an HTTP request to adx.com to get the ad to place in the displayed page. Note that once again, the referrer field of the HTTP GET request is set here to New York Times, and the adx cookie value of 7493 is included again because, because my browser already had an adx cookie value of 7493 in its cookie jar. Well, the adx server sees the 7493 cookie value, records the fact that the browser with this cookie value also reads the New York Times art page, 
It also knows that I read the sports page and already knows that I'm looking for a pair of socks. It's learning more about me. AdX is also going to have to decide what ad to return to me. What kind of ad should it send? Well, the AdX server looks at the cookie value 7493 and says, hey, this user's recently been shopping for socks. So if I serve up a socks ad, maybe the user will buy the socks. And if I can find a pair of socks with the New York Times logo on it, then that would be a great ad to serve. If the user does buy socks by clicking through the served ad, AdX is going to get additional revenue because of the sale made through that ad. So of course, AdX serves up an ad to me for a pair of socks with the New York Times logo on them. So we've seen two forms of cookies. There are first party cookies. These are cookies that are issued and maintained by websites that you've explicitly chosen to visit. Then there are third party cookies. These third party cookies are issued by websites that you never explicitly chose to visit, but maybe your web browser was referred to there by a link in an embedded, an embedded link in a page that you actually did download. That ad example that we just took a look at. These visits to third party websites could be explicit, so you actually see that web page, uh, that ad, for instance, displayed, or it could actually be hidden from you. For example, some websites will embed an image that your browser will have to go fetch that's only one pixel big, so you can't even see it. But when you download the initial page, it's got the reference to that one pixel image. Your browser, of course, goes off to that third party website to retrieve an image that'll be displayed, but it's too small for you to even see. So you might not even know that you visited a third party website. Third party cookies have been used for user tracking now for well over a decade. As privacy concerns started to mount, the default for Firefox and Safari browsers was changed to disable third party cookies. Google had planned to change Chrome's default to also disable third party cookies in 2022, but now that's been pushed out to 2023. So we've seen how cookies can raise concerns about your personal data. For example, third parties being able to track your web browsing behavior. And a natural reaction to this is, as the saying goes, hey, there ought to be a law against that. Well, are there laws that govern cookies and how they can be used to gather personal data? Well, the answer to that question is either yes or no, depending on where you live. If you're a citizen of the European Union, then the answer is yes. In 2018, the EU passed a law known as the General Data Protection Regulation, known by its initials GDPR. And interestingly, GDPR has specific language about cookies that you can see here. And, and let me read it. It says, natural persons may be associated with online identifiers, such as internet protocol addresses, cookie identifiers, and other identifiers. This may leave traces which, in particular, when combined with unique identifiers and other information received by the servers, may be used to create profiles of the natural persons and identify them. <laughs> well, that sounds like a mouthful of legalese, and I'm not even sure what a natural person is, but I assume that you and I are both natural persons. But what this means is that when cookies can identify an individual, and note I said individual person, not browser, then cookies are considered personal data subject to GDPR personal data regulations. And let me stress here that the issue is about identifying persons, well, natural persons. In our examples earlier, cookies were associated with a browser, not a person. But depending on how cookies are used, they might identify a specific individual as well. For example, if you're logging in and you're using credentials and get a cookie for that, then your natural person is associated with that cookie. Generic cookies, like the ones we just studied, can also be combined with other data like IP addresses, as suggested in GDPR, to identify you as a person. Well, the upshot of GDPR is that many websites now require you to give explicit consent about how cookies are going to be used when you visit their site. Whether first party cookies are used, whether third party cookies might be used. Here's the website of the French National Research Lab where I've worked, INRIA, and sure enough, right here on the homepage, before I get to navigate anywhere, I see some buttons that I need to click through to determine how cookies will be used with my browser on this site. These kinds of requirements are a direct result of GDPR. 
Well, that's it for our short study of cookies and how they can be used to track users. And I hope you found this really interesting. I mean, to me, this is incredibly interesting because it lies at the intersection of technology, the web, browsers, cookies, privacy issues, and laws like GDPR that are being developed both to control the technology and to give users more explicit control over their personal data. I hope you found this as interesting as I did.